morning and welcome to Morning Movie News and day five of this special run of all viewer question episodes. Well, I'm away on a personal vacation. I'll be back this Thursday. Uh, so today and tomorrow are the final all viewer question episodes. And I've been doing three questions uh, per day. So today's three questions, the first is from Tomer and Tomer is from Israel. And Tomer says, my question is about the Avengers and Spider-Man. Do you think Sony would let Marvel use Spider-Man in an Avengers film if Marvel would take care of all the financial issues and all the creative issues of the movie? It seems like Tomer just wants to get uh, Sony off of Spider-Man. Uh, and just let them uh, use the franchise for one movie, saying let Marvel use Spider-Man for one movie, and give Sony in exchange a decent percentage of the profit. Uh, and if so, who's the winner of this deal? Thanks and love your show. Thank you, Tomer. Uh, I hope you're having a great day over in Israel. I love hearing from people from all over the globe on this show, because as we always talk about, movies are becoming a, a global business and experience. And of course, superhero movies are enjoyed the world over these days. Uh, so in regards to your question, when the Avengers first came out, I did a video about how uh, they had wanted to use Oscorp, the Oscorp Tower, in the uh, Manhattan, you know, uh, uh, landscape, uh, you know, the cityscape uh, for the Avengers. You know, kind of in, when they showed shots of the city, they wanted not only have Avengers Tower, but Oscorp Tower in the background. And the only thing that kept this from happening is that Oscorp Tower simply wasn't ready. It hadn't been designed for the Amazing Spider-Man reboot, so they couldn't send over, uh, you know, the schematics technically for the special effects team to integrate it. So that's the only reason that didn't happen. So as you can see, Tomer, it's already being discussed by the powers that be. So that leads me to believe that this could actually happen. Now, there are a number of reasons besides, though, this article about uh, wanting to have um, Oscorp Tower in the Avengers. The other is that, uh, as you'll notice, the Disney logo does appear in front of the Amazing Spider-Man trailer for some of the international trailers. And that's because I think Disney is resigned to the fact that that is a final sale of Spider-Man to Marvel. As I've noted when I was over at Marvel, um, through the grapevine, I heard that Sony had actually purchased a percentage of the rights to the Spider-Man character itself, not just the film rights, so that Sony is heavily involved in everything that happens with Spider-Man. Uh, so that's never going to go away. This isn't like Fox, where if they stop making the movies, they lose the, those character rights. Uh, it's, it's, it's done. Forever, for all time, Sony owns Spider-Man. Literally, the character as well. So I think that's why you saw them working together with the, not just the cityscape, but why in the future you could potentially see uh, a team up between Sony and Marvel Disney with the characters. Now, of course, Sony's been very vocal about this because this would be tremendously helpful to them if they could actually say, we don't only have a character who's owned by Marvel, but they've appeared in the Avengers movies, although we get the, um, you know, the financial rewards when we continue to make our Spider-Man movies. And of course, Sony's making an entire Spider-Man cinematic universe. They're really going to focus not so much, and this is what's interesting about it, they're not going to so much branch out heroes as Marvel has done and DC is doing, they're going to be branching out their villains into movies. So they'll make a Venom, he's an anti-hero, I guess, you know, they're going to make a Venom movie, a Sinister Six movie. Uh, so that's what you're seeing happening over at Sony. And so I think that they are, for that reason, they are pushing very hard to maybe get Spider-Man into an Avengers movie, even for a cameo. And Andrew Garfield has also said he would love to do this. Uh, now the question is, will Marvel let them? So here's the thing. As to your question, who is the winner? I think the winner would be Sony. I think that it would give credibility. It would be the Marvel, literally, the Marvel stamp of approval on the cinematic universe that they're building. So um, I think they would even, I think they would even give Spider-Man to Marvel for a cameo for like the smallest sliver of, per I would almost say they would do it for free, but that seems unlikely in Hollywood. But for the sl smallest sliver of percentage of profits, they would just be like, just take them for one scene, please. We would, it would be so great for the reasons I just outlined. But I think for that reason, that might be the one thing that Marvel would keep Marvel from agreeing to this. Because right now, Marvel's the big cheese. Marvel's the only one that's got it right. Marvel can do no wrong. I mean, that day may end, and that might be the day they pick up the call and call up, so pick up the phone and call up Sony and say, maybe we will use Spider-Man. But right now, I think they, they are really, you know, the king of the king of the comic book films, and I think they want to maintain that position. I think they don't want to give out their stamp of approval to a competing franchise, even if they are stuck in bed with Sony forever, for all intents and purposes, because of that original deal made before Marvel was really into the movie business themselves. Uh, you know, obviously, the Spider-Man movies are one of the first big Marvel movies to come out, uh, and look what happened. Uh, so I, I think that that's what's going to happen there. I think, uh, you know, maybe they'll do it, maybe they won't. Uh, I think Marvel is the one dragging their feet, and I think Sony would be the one to benefit. And, um, you know, you never say never, and I think that of all the crossovers, this is the one that has the most potential because Marvel Studios is never getting those rights back. Never, ever, 
ever. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because I think we're all pretty happy with what Sony's been doing with them in the Mark Webb uh, reign. People were happy with Raimi. That totally went off the rails. But I think Webb is, I think Webb, the, the loyalty that Webb has to the source material is really impressive. I've been, I really like what he's doing with it. All right, so that's the first question of the day. Thank you, Tomer. All right, the second question comes from, um, <clears throat> comes from John Haig. And John Haig says, Hi, Grace, long-time viewer, first-time question. I love those. Why is there a specific production position called the casting director or casting? This position seems to be pretty important because it often appears right after the cast names in the films. Uh, why are, you know, it, by the way, though, when you're seeing the credits in the beginning of a movie, it goes from least important to most important after the actors. That's why writer director go last and right before them, the producers tend to go. So that's, so casting actually isn't hugely important, but it is important to, it is important to the movie in general, but in terms of the hierarchy of power on a film, not huge. Um, but John continues saying, why are the director and producer and the writer the people making such important decisions? Thanks, smiley face. Thank you, John. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, directors, producers, and writers are involved. Well, actually, a writer is never involved in casting decisions. A writer writes the script and says, okay, and then prays to the movie gods that it turns out even close to what they wrote, and they don't hire someone else to come on and rewrite it. it you know, being a writer is a very perilous career where you have to get used to disappointment and frustration. But, you know, unless the writer also happens to be a producer on the film uh, or the director. But, you know, if you're just the writer... You hand in your work and you go. Um, you know, maybe sometimes you're still, I talked about the other day about the Red 2 writers, which were fortunate enough to be involved on the set, but they still wouldn't be involved in casting decisions. The director and the producer are involved in casting, but um, I think the producer is really the main person who has to okay it because they're the money person. They have a responsibility to make sure this thing is, uh, you know, box off, viable at the box office. They're the main proponent of uh deciding who stars in a film. Now, the director can be very influential. You know, obviously the producer wants the director to be happy, but of course there's those famous stories about Francis Ford Coppola having like, epileptic fits in the Paramount offices because they wanted Robert Redford to be Michael Corleone and he was having a very hard time talking them out of it. So as you can see, uh, the suits and the producers were the ones who were calling the shots there. But also a director weighs in on casting, for instance, if they use their connections. If they say, well, I, you know, for instance, Steve McQueen always works with Michael Fassbender. It's like almost a given. Almost you hire my, uh, Steve McQueen with the understanding you will be getting Michael Fassbender. So that's where kind of where a director comes in. Uh, they, the producer wants to make them happy. And also uh, the director wants to work with people they're familiar with. They have a good relationship. And sometimes that's the reason a director gets a gig, because they bring somebody in. They bring in talent. And, you know, the producer can use that director's reputation to lure the talent they, they, they want, the way help the film. But what does the casting director do? All right, so the, the producer and the director, uh, they really are, they really lead the charge when it comes to casting the big names in the movie. The pe person is going to be the draw, the lead roles, often only maybe even one or two lead roles. They're the ones who are like, okay, I have to attach X to my script to even get the studio to greenlight it. So they really, even before the casting director comes on board or is hired, they're going out and making the call saying, for instance, uh, you know, Johnny Depp, we want you to be in Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, that's something that's put together before the whole rest of the team is put together for a movie. But then once you have your big star that gets you the green light, you have your script, you're all ready to move forward, uh, you have your director, and you're ready to move forward into the um, pre-production, now you have to cast. So the casting director comes in and works on several levels. For the bigger roles where you're going to use semi-name talent, which isn't your big huge deal that got the movie made, the casting director will come up with a list of suggestions to run by the producer and the director. The producer and the director are very busy. They don't have the time to just sit there and go on the internet and Google actors and like, well, who could we use? Whereas a casting director will not only give them a list of potential actors that are already popular, but a casting director goes to a lot of plays, talks to agents, and they, and they understand who up-and-coming talent is. They can go to the director and the producer, largely, let's just say the producer, because the director, the producer will then go to the director, you know, independently, or, you know, it's really a discussion between the producer and the casting director. So anyway, the casting director comes to the producer and says, okay, you have to cast, let's say, for instance, let's take Jack Ryan, Shadow Recruit. Chris Pine, already cast, uh, as the lead role in the film. That's helped get it green light. It was a big deal that he was going to be the new Jack Ryan. Now they need to cast his wife. Now, Keira Knightley eventually got the role, but that was something that was a cast, you know, the casting director had to come up with a list of people for them to consider. So, you know, a lot of other actresses were up for that role that, um, 
Keira Knightley originally got. So that, that list came from the casting director. So the casting director will pick people who are already popular and up and comers. So, you know, they can be like, hey, you want to discover somebody with this movie? Here's a list of people who are getting a lot of heat in the theater community or their agents, you know, have big things planned for them. There aren't a lot of movies right now, but they're shooting a lot of movies that will be released before this one. So maybe they'll get them, you know, at the height of their popularity just when they're starting to blow up big. Uh, that's kind of what the casting director does there. So then there are the smaller roles, though, that, you know, they don't have a name. You have, like, a, you know, somebody who isn't famous playing them. And the director and producer, you know, even though the, this is kind of where the, the producer doesn't care about this role, it doesn't affect the bottom line, then the director steps in and picks the right person for the role. They have the casting director will do the initial casting call. They'll weed out who they think is good, who isn't good. Uh, and then only towards the final rounds of casting will you actually get to meet the director, and they'll weigh in on the last three to four people that the casting director chose. Now, of course, as you can probably uh, see here, this gives the casting director enormous power, not only over actors of who makes it, who doesn't, because they're the gatekeeper to the director, but also of how a movie looks. They're shaping it. They're putting names up there. And I have often thought that this is a little too much power to be given to casting directors. And I think you casting directors have proven themselves of being good at this. One is, for instance, Deborah Zane, Billy Zane's mother. Really great casting director, very famous. Uh, you'll see some names that are constantly used because they're pretty good at casting. Uh, but in general, there are very few famous casting directors. But Deborah Zane is uh, one of them. She was, she's, I don't think she works quite as much anymore. Uh, but, you know, she's someone who became famous as a casting director. But in general, you know, they're the first, they take care of this thing that the director and producer just don't have time to do. So I hope, John, that it's been helpful to you to understand the different areas where a casting director works, to what degree they work, how they help the casting director, how they help the director and the producer, uh, where, they, where they fill in, where they just help, where they take charge, etc. All right, so that's the second question. All right, the third question of the day comes from Tim. So thank you for signing your name because your, your, your username is like rcflyerrob1. So anyway, Tim says, your longtime viewer, Tim. That's excellent. Thank you, Tim. So Tim's question is, quick question for you, Grace. So I am relatively young right now, still a minor. Great for you, Tim, that you're thinking about this. So you can, especially these days, you're never too young to start thinking about your future and your career. And Tim says, I have hopes of Sunday becoming a filmmaker. That's wonderful. I'm so happy that you've decided what you want to do professionally. That's a hard decision to make. And Tim says, I was wondering what should young people like myself do to start getting familiar with how to make good characters and story and how to direct and how just the whole process of making a good film works. Now, just last week, I answered a similar question to this from uh, the Batman nerd. I still have my notes up from there. And the Batman, because uh, I filmed this all before I left on vacation, and the Batman nerd had asked about what movies to watch to become a good filmmaker uh, for your first movie, etc. <clears throat> this is kind of in the same vein, so I would refer you back to that episode for that answer. Uh, that was um, last Monday, I believe the 17th, February 17th. All right, so that was the February 17th episode. But as for Tim's question, I wanted to elaborate on it. That's why I picked this one. I think it's very important to realize when you want to become a filmmaker, maybe you might be narrowing yourself a little bit too much. You might just say to yourself, I want to work in Hollywood. And I believe I've talked about this a little bit before, but I wanted to reiterate it. Pick an area you want to work in, and then pick a couple different jobs you'd be interested in. Because you never know where, where you're meant to be, where it's going to work out. I think very few people end up where they expect it. Um, because, you know, sometimes the opportunity, you can't really dictate where it's going to come up. But anyway, I would say, my first advice, Tim, is to be open to different career paths in the same general area that you're interested in. So that's my first bit of advice. My second bit of advice is you cannot learn you just you cannot learn too much about the field you want to go into. You really want to make yourself an expert. You want to learn about the different jobs that you could potentially have, uh, how they contribute, the reality of the jobs. So many people are not, just like this, I just answered this question about casting director. Maybe some of you might have heard that and said, I want to be a casting director. Maybe I will be that famous casting director that is yet to exist, because I think I'd be good at picking who should be in a movie. So just, and then also as a director, you, or as a writer, you might have just learned that you wouldn't be involved in casting much to your horror. So maybe that'll change how you feel about maybe wanting to be a writer. So make sure you actually understand the reality of the job you will have. Not what you would like it to entail, but what it will actually entail. That's my second bit of advice. My third bit of advice is, well, not everybody needs to go to school to study stuff. There's always stories like James Cameron, who was a truck driver who taught himself filmmaking, or Quentin Tarantino, who worked in a video store and just watched a bunch of movies and also taught himself filmmaking. That, that can happen. But I think that you would really benefit yourself to do some kind of studying. Uh, you know, it's important to take the time. These schools, if you get, hopefully you'll get into, you know, a school that is, some schools, I'm sad to say, in every profession, just take your money. 
<clears throat> so make sure you do your research. It doesn't always have to be the best name school, but just make sure you talk to students who are already there. Um, I even had some qualms with, you know, my education. I felt there are some areas where I wasn't educated the best that I could have been. <clears throat> so, you know, also that's another thing. Don't just, you know, trust somebody else with your future. You are the one who has to succeed, so make sure you do your own homework uh, because at the end of the day, it's, it's you who, who will be affected. Uh, so, and so then, but I would say getting an education in your field is important. It does make a difference. Uh, you know, maybe you'll have to make your own way anyway, but don't just write off and say, well, James Cameron and Quentin Tarantino did it, uh, especially for some of the other jobs. You know, people who are hiring like that you have a stamp of approval for some uh, some school. Now, a school isn't going to get you a job. In some, some other professions, they heavily recruit. Although USC, if you want to be like a cinematographer, an editor, USC, because it's based in Los Angeles and has a very strong reputation in those fields, people do actively recruit from that school. Uh, if you want to be a writer, director, or a very creative job, these are all creative jobs, but I think you know what I mean. You're out of luck because nobody actively recruits those people. Uh, but so, I think, you know, and also you want to see what, this, what the odds of success are in each job. How much are you willing to risk to become a director when there are maybe more jobs available for being a DP? And maybe, you know, look at Wally Pfister. He's a DP for Nolan and he's now become a director. There are many paths to, to the final place you want to become. Uh, and so I would recommend getting a good education, doing your homework yourself, and being realistic. Be realistic with yourself. You're not going to do yourself any favors uh, by, you know, ignoring things maybe that you don't like. Uh, you have to deal with them because they're going to come up, uh, and there's nothing you can do to avoid them. All right, Tim, so I hope that's helpful to you. Uh, I'm glad you're watching this show, and I hope that it helps you uh, with pursuing this goal because um, it's, a, it's a great goal. Hollywood's a great business. Uh, I certainly want to be a part of it as well, and I found a way that I can contribute. So um, good luck to you. Break a leg, and I hope that I was helpful. All right, thank you for watching, and, and maybe there's one last uh, episode of all of your questions, so we'll see who gets their question answered tomorrow. Bye.